<laughs> this video. <coughs> This video is brought to you by the fine people over at HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com and use my code 10BLAZE. 10 free meals, including free shipping. Mwah! That is actually a chef's kiss because you will become a world-class chef with HelloFresh. Not a guarantee, definitely not on the talking points, but it is delicious. This is an episode of Business Blaze. I am your boy with the Blaze, also known as Simon, also known as dickhead. Welcome. Welcome. My glasses are very dirty. Just gonna give those a little bit of a shining. Like that movie The Shining with Jack. No, it's got nothing to do with it. I don't know why is, why is that movie called The Shining? Does he see some sort of shining? Does he shine his axe? Ha ha ha! It's a joke. It's all a joke. This, uh, what happens here is Daddy will write me a script. I will read the script. I'll make some bad jokes. Sam will add some fine memes, sprinkle them in, and uh, that's what happens here. This is the world's most ridiculous, oh no, not the world's, just most ridiculous lawsuits. Let's see how long of an introduction Danny's got for me today. It looks to be about six paragraphs. Not bad. Last time it was just two lines. <laughs> so, okay. If you haven't seen that, that's because this video released before the last one, and you're soon gonna see a video with a short introduction. I film these, and then they go out and they why is this chair here? I film these and then they go out in a completely different order and everyone gets confused and everyone in the comments is like, Simon, what are you talking about? What's a cauliflower steak? You've never mentioned that before. And then the next video, everyone's like, oh, the cauliflower steak reference. <laughs> it's good to see how the judiciary system has come along in leaps and bounds over the last few thousand years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been a few thousand years. If something hasn't come along in leaps and bounds, then we're doing something wrong. Like religion has not come along in leaps and bounds and it's all f now. Uh, when it comes to a resolving a civil dispute, we no longer have to challenge each other to a duel or throw women into rivers or retrieve a stone from a cauldron of boiling water to see if our hands will heal to prove that God is on our side. I mean, today, maybe your hands will heal because there's modern medicine and we understand germs. It's not like, oh yeah, what causes infection? Smells. It's definitely bad smells. <laughs> My germ. <laughs> My germ. <laughs> My asthma theory is a whole f up thing. But uh, anyway, I mean, back in the day, if you get like really blistered up hands, you're, you're gonna get an infection and die. It's like you just are. <laughs> Nowadays, even the littlest of little men can take on the mightiest of mighty corporate company corporations and expect the evidence of the case to be considered fairly and without prejudice by a completely sane judge, ideally not from Texas. Yeah, because the guys with the more expensive lawyers never do better, do they? Never, never happens, never heard of that. The advantage of all this is that the common man now has the opportunity to seek justice and right a wrong without having to throw his wife into the river or keep his burnt fingers crossed for divine intervention. What is we do we used to throw our women into rivers? Why is up with that? I mean, I know it's the past. The past was the worst. We've established this before. Indeed, there is a t-shirt on the Business Blaze merch store which says the past was the worst. I'd encourage you to purchase it because I like money. The downside is that some deeply aggrieved souls will always be inclined to abuse the system by launching the most frivolous of lawsuits to settle a case which could have easily been resolved with sensible, with a sensible five minute conversation and a small goodwill discount voucher. And it's not just America. This crazy sh is kicking off all around the world. It's just mostly in America. America is, it's all very litigious. Like, why are Americans suing each other all? I've never been, I've been threatened with lawsuits and I very quickly acquiesce. They've been like, yep, yeah, okay, please don't sue me. I will acquiesce. It's happened twice, I think. I don't remember what the first one was. I definitely remember what the second one was because it was scary. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm sorry. Please, please don't sue me. I like my things. I don't want to lose all my money. <laughs> Although America is the greatest nation in the world, we still face many modern problems. But I generally don't live in a very, like, if I slipped over in someone's shop and broke my arm, I'm not gonna sue anyone. It's like, I, and if they were mopping the floor and there wasn't a sign there, I'd be like, well, I should have been aware that the floor was right, shouldn't I? <laughs> More fool me. But instead, it's like, yeah, let's see. Like, uh, this happened to a friend of mine here. She slipped over in a store, she didn't realize the floor was wet, and she broke her leg in like many places, and that's like a big metal thing. And, and the idea that she'd sue the store, it didn't even occur to her. And I'm like, good. I remember my dad was in a car, I think I told this story before, my dad was in a car accident, it's definitely his fault. Like he crashed into someone because he wasn't looking at a roundabout. And then the guy gets out of the car and he's completely fine. And then a few weeks later, my dad gets a letter or his insurance company gets a letter being like, yeah, that guy's suing you because he broke it. You know, like he injured his neck, he got some whiplash. And my dad's like, 
you didn't get whiplash. He just saw one of those ads on TV saying like, you've been in a car accident. Have you got a bit of a hurty neck? Uh, the reluctant fireman. Uh, is what's going on? Here's a, just a small sprinkling of some of the looniest lawsuits ever to have disgraced the modern legal system and made us wonder if resolving disputes by duel was really such a terrible idea in the first place. Uh, it was. It definitely was. Dueling was not uh, a good idea. Also, if we mention the McDonald's coffee woman uh, being a frivolous lawsuit, I'm gonna get really upset because it's not a frivolous lawsuit. That coffee was at like fucking insanely hot. Like way hotter than coffee ever is served. And the woman got like third degree burns on her legs. So I'm like, I'm not saying it's not her fault. I mean, obviously part of it's her fault. She shouldn't be like driving a car or being a passenger in a car and putting like hot coffee between her legs. But it's not a frivolous lawsuit. The reluctant fireman. Disability discrimination in the workplace is clearly a serious matter. Except perhaps in the case of Shane Prolo. Oh, we are treading on some thin ice, Danny. I don't want to have to, I don't want to get cancelled again. Uh, a former captain of the fire suppression crew of the Houston Fire Department. You see, fireman Shane had a bit of a problem, which was putting a dampener on the productivity at the fire station. He was absolutely terrified of fire. And this led to a bizarre counterclaim to a lawsuit in 2014 in which Shane claimed that the city was guilty of disability discrimination on the grounds that they were very keen to leave a fireman leave a man with a fire phobia in charge of putting out a fire it's ridiculous also a phobia isn't a disability is a phobia a disability it's like i'm i have a little bit i'm a little bit afraid of heights like i don't know like 90 percent of people are a little bit afraid of heights because you go up the top of a tall building you're like really high up here slightly scary i feel that it's completely normal 90 percent of people have that but it's not i'm not disabled I think that really makes it so the problem is when we start calling everything a disability right the actual disabilities get watered down and that's stupid uh the problem was first spotted in 2004 when shane failed to enter a blaze hashtag cancel simon probably i probably said something that offended someone there but it does make sense right Right? Uh, when F Shane failed to enter a blazing building on account of the flames, which were making him feel a bit dizzy. His colleagues at the time were left feeling pretty annoyed about this. A couple of years later, after arriving on the scene of a more serious fiery incident, how is it a couple of years later? He's a fireman! What is he doing all the time? Just getting cats out of trees? Shane got himself in such a state that he couldn't even put on his firefighting gear or walk in a straight line. One of his colleagues had to escort him next door and sit him down on a bucket while the rest of the crew got the job done of dowsing the inferno and saving lives. Shane's doctor later claimed that his patient had suffered an episode of global transient amnesia, a very sudden and temporary case of memory loss, which was triggered by a phobia of fire. I mean, I'm not employed, but it's like, yeah, I got a phobia of work. I just don't want to do it. It's like, and then it'll be like, Simon, you have to work. Your job is to, you know, you've got a job to do here, fact boy. You read the facts. I'll be like, I'm afraid of it. Keep paying me. I'm disabled. <laughs> You're not disabled, fact boy. Uh, which was triggered by a phobia of fire, so it's possible that he may just have forgotten he was supposed to be a fireman. Taking all of this into account, Shane's employer figured that it was not entirely unreasonable to consider moving Shane to a different department. It's not unreasonable to be like Shane off. I mean, I don't want to be insensitive to your fear of fire, but you cannot be a fireman. You need to find some other sort of employment. I'll give you a reference saying that you were... Uh... I'm not going to give you a reference, Shane. You're going to have to find a job on your own. It's not like Shane lost his job. He was simply transferred to a new role in the training academy. But Shane... <laughs> but Shane wasn't having any of this. And he launched uh, an administrative appeal in which he, uh, the hearing examiner actually sided with the reluctant fireman and ruled that he should be reassigned back to the fire suppression unit. Oh, it's gone too far. We've gone too far with the PC stuff on this one, guys. The city wasn't happy about this result and took the case to court to fight the forced reassignment, fearing that a pants-shitting, dizzy, amnesiac, bucket hockey fireman <laughs> wasn't the ideal choice to head up the emergency fire rescue operation. And in response, Shane launched a counterclaim in which he alleged that his fear of fire was a disability and that the city was illegally discriminating him in breach of the Americans with Disabilities Act. No, Shane, no. Now, of course, I would imagine that most people are quite cautious around fire, and I have nothing but the utmost respect for the bravery and heroism of the people who actually choose to take on such a dangerous and challenging role. Yes, I have an enormous respect for firemen because they risk our lives, their lives, to save our lives. Like, and all we do is pay them. I'm like, you wouldn't pay, I I'm not risking my life for money, f that. But these people do it every day and I have an enormous respect for them. But Shane, you are not a fireman. But maybe not everyone is cut out for the job and it's difficult to see why a man who is utterly petrified of fire was so keen to hang on to his helmet. Surprisingly, the jury in the lower court took Shane's side in the case and initially awarded him $362,000 in damages. Damages for what? 
I mean, I, I don't know how much a fireman gets paid, but it's not it's not gonna be $362,000 over like, that's, that's way too much money, what's going on? And Shane, they've been paying you to not do a job for years, apparently. However, the judge in the Texas Supreme Court later overturned this decision and concluded that Shane Prola probably did, have a, did not have a disability and therefore the case did not fall under the Americans with Disabilities Act. As he put it, if one considers the NBA, the capacity to play professional basketball is a ability and the rest of us do not suffer from a disability because we cannot play at that level a job skill required for a specific job is not a disability if most people lack that skill that's bad news for me and my application to become pro a professional lion tamer good i'm glad the supreme judge saw sense that's probably why he's supreme the man who sued his twin I'm sure that most of us have been told at some point in our lives that we look a little bit like a particular celebrity. Dude, all the time. All the- Ah, oh, look, it's Michael from Vsauce. Ah, oh, look, it's binging with Babish. For f**k's sake. It should be like, Michael from Vsauce looks like Simon. Come on! And I suppose our goals. <laughs> And I suppose our reactions will largely depend on the celebrity to which we're being compared. There's a world of difference between being told that you look like Brad Pitt, I get that too. I get that all the time. And being told that you look like Meatloaf after he let himself go a bit. I have no idea what Meatloaf looks like. Over the years, I've been told by different people that I look like Jarvis Cocker from Britpop band Pulp, Danny Glover from Lethal Weapon, and the, Mil the Milky Bar Kid, and Jesus Christ. All right, that is a that is diverse. In the case of, the blo of a bloke from Portland, Oregon by the name of Alan Heckert, he often got told that he looked a bit like the former NBA superstar businessman and cultural icon Michael Jordan. Look, I mean, if you look like Mike, that's not, what's the problem? It's like, that's just good. Okay, I mean, maybe so you'll get treated better in places. In fact, he reckons he heard this quite a lot, every single day for 15 twatting years. And it reached a point where he got so fed up with the comparison that he decided to strike back. In 2006, he sued Michael Jordan, along with Knight co-founder Phil Knight, for a total of $832 million dollars mate you are smoking the crack is that what you smoke do you smoke crack alan reckons that nike's high profile marketing campaign had turned michael jordan into an instantly recognizable face that alan was getting mistaken from all the time which doesn't really make sense when you think about it but none of this silly lawsuit made any sense at all obviously not they've all been smoking the crack pipe alan was seeking 416 million dollars from each of the defendants which was broken down into 364 million dollars worth of punitives and 52 million dollars in damages damages for what Rainy. ow this is <laughs> He broke my heart. He claims that the alleged resemblance had wrecked his nerves, denied him peace of mind, caused problems at work, and inflicted emotional distress. Perhaps it also sent him batshit crazy. I mean, to file this sort of lawsuit, it really had to have. It's not entirely clear what Alan expected Michael Jordan to do all about. I don't know. Find him, beat his face in until he didn't look like him anymore. I'm not suggesting that Michael Jordan do that. Don't do that, Mike. And it's also worth noting that Alan was eight years older, about 30 pounds lighter and six inches shorter. Dude, you don't look like Michael Jordan. I mean, they were both African-American. They had both got a shaved head and they both wore a single earring. Take it out then! But surely Alan could have saved himself a lot of trauma by maybe growing his hair or even ditching the earring. Yes! It's remarkable that the case even got as far as the Oregon State Court, but Alan eventually drop the charges without explaining why i don't know maybe he stopped smoking crack and nike smokes and a nike spokesman confirmed that no money had exchanged hands if nike paid them out i would be so horribly disappointed perhaps alan heckard can rest easier at night now that he's finally made it clear to the world that he's definitely not michael jordan i bet nobody's ever going to mention that resemblance again i do think it's a shame that the case wasn't allowed to reach a conclusion though it would have been funny if michael jordan had been fined 416 million dollars but then the bill got sent to alan heckard that would be great counter sue him michael for looking like you although as we discussed earlier in this video the fact that michael jordan could afford much better lawyers would definitely not affect the outcome of that case at all now a quick word from our glorious sponsor, HelloFresh. Uh, HelloFresh does sound like, hello darling. Hello Fresh, how you doing? Hello Fresh. Do you ever find you're never, do, never gonna do that again, don't worry. Do you ever find yourself in a recipe rut? Well, you can break out of that with HelloFresh. Plus, you can save time. Oh my God, cooking takes forever. People might be like, Simon, are you joking? Like, it's not that hard to cook. It's not that hard to cook, is it? You just pull the pan and I'm like, look, 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 by the time you go to the supermarket, I'm also I'm busy, in case you couldn't tell. If you're like, Simon just does this YouTube channel where he occasionally posts videos, it's like, bro, I got nine other channels where I'm posting all the time. I got like a young kid. I got all the going on in my life and I like to cook because I don't want to be an unhealthy 
can just have takeout all the time because eventually I'd die really young and I'd get really fat. But it, it does take forever. I mean, because you go to the store, you buy some shit you need, and then you're like, ah, oh, but you don't, you don't have this one ingredient I need. So you're like, okay, well, I'll pop into the little corner store and I'll pick it up there. And then you get it, and then you get home, and you go and unpack it all, and then you got to look up the recipe, you got to do all this, like, and then hours have gone by, and you're like, oh, I eat the meal, it takes like 10 minutes. It's like, what the f is going on? Well, good news, folks. HelloFresh is here to save you. Also, the recipe rut thing. Do you ever find yourself cooking the same shit over and over again? I absolutely do. I mean, it's largely because I like the things that I cook over and over again, but I also like to discover new things, and HelloFresh is a fantastic... I don't know if that, they actually say that as a selling point, but it is, because they'll just ship you some like new recipe you never tried, and you're like, that sounds good. And then, I mean, yes, you can order it from HelloFresh again, but I mean, I don't know if I should say this, but you could definitely keep the recipe cards, and then if they're not offering it, or you just don't want to do it with HelloFresh for whatever reason because you're crazy. You can keep the recipe card. So it's it's kind of like you learn and you get all the be it's there's multiple benefits. I don't know if I should say, just keep the recipe cards and cook it again, but it is a genuine advantage. Uh, also you could be it's, it's flexible. So if you're like I'm going on holiday, I mean it'd be a bit weird if it wasn't flexible and you went on holiday and you got back and there's just all this rotting food at your house. You're like, brilliant. Not that anyone goes on holiday because of COVID. Also, this is a really brilliant thing to have in COVID. Oh, they even say that. Okay, good. Look, I'm hitting all the talking points without even trying. Mwah! Also, uh, there's a couple of things to make you feel good. Maybe you're like, mm, of course, Simon. Oh, hello, fresh. I'm the best. Ah, oh. but I'm worried about the, the packaging. I'm worried about the wasted. Well, don't be, because they make the stuff that it comes in entirely recyclable, and much of it has already been recycled. <laughs> Amazing! Anyway, look, I, uh, I've actually never had HelloFresh cross my lips, because I don't live in the land of the free, the home of the brave, the good and the great America. But David, who I do the Today I Found Out channel with, I had the stuff shipped to him. <laughs> he was like, can I have some free food? And I was like, yes, mate, you can. And he made it and he was like, Simon, it's incredible. It's everything that I dreamed it would be. And so, yes, look, you can go to HelloFresh.com, use the code 10Blaze, and you'll get 10 free meals. That's a lot of meals. That's a lot of meals. And free shipping? You'd think like, oh, it's 10 free meals, but the shipping's gonna be like $700. It's not, it's free. HelloFresh. Repeat the CTA. HelloFresh.com, code 10 Blaze, 10 free meals, including free shipping. Hello, Fresh Bud Light Fantasies. I'll just let's start off by saying that, in my opinion, Bud Light is a shit beer. It tastes like nothing. It, regular Bud is shit. Bud Light is turbo shit, allegedly, in my opinion. I'll admit that I felt a bit let down by misleading TV commercials over the years. During the 80s and 90s, the marketing conveys for Coca-Cola, complete with slogans such as, What a feeling! And I don't know if they sang it like that. <laughs> and Coca-Cola is it! Temporarily led me to believe that Coca-Cola was a positively orgasmic elevation into a higher level of understanding and awareness, uh, rather than quite a pleasant carbonated soft drink, which comes in handy when you're feeling a bit thirsty. A 58-year-old government employee from Michigan called Richard Overton must have experienced similar disappointment when he recovered, when he discovered that a bottle of Bud Light didn't seem to deliver on all the elements that the TV commercials clearly suggested. This wouldn't perhaps be too surprising for most viewers, as the commercial in question featured a couple of grisly truck drivers taking a sip of Bud Light and then finding themselves transported to a tropical paradise setting in which they're fawned over by a parade of adoring, scantily clad women. Ooh la la. After stocking up on this dream drinking 1993, poor old Richard, also known as Dick, uh, felt upset when he discovered that consuming shitloads of Bud Light didn't magically make his wildest fantasies come true after all. In fact, all this Vietnam veteran ended up with was a banging headache, a lighter wallet, and vomit stains all over the carpet of what you would assume to be a one bedroom apartment. <laughs> King savage, Danny. Savage. Uh, so to help cure this hangover from hell, Richard filed a $10,000 lawsuit against Anheuser-Busch, the US company responsible for producing and selling the devilish brew. Dude, when I wake up with a raging hangover, I don't immediately think I'm gonna sue that beer company. I'm like, oh, what have I done with my, what am I doing with my life? Why? And then like, if it's a particularly bad one, you're like, oh, there's nothing I can do. This is gonna be with me till about three o'clock in the afternoon while I start feeling better. And I'm never gonna drink again 24 hours later. <laughs> This sounds pretty good right about now. Esse é pior que o tubarão que é o lição, ó. Aí, ó. Tá bom. Chega. Você vai embora.
When I first heard this story, I wondered if maybe Richard wasn't quite as bonkers as he sounds. Maybe he was some kind of anti-alcohol evangelist on a crusade against the evils of seductive advertising for stinking, dirty booze. His lawsuit claimed that the commercials violated Michigan's Pricing and Advertising Act because the scenic tropical settings of beautiful women and men engaged in unrestricted merriment implied that Bud Light will make a customer's fantasy become a reality, when in fact the product is, a, is dangerous and could lead to addiction, health problems and death. Look mate, this is something in the advertising world, or the legal world, that is called a puff. It is something that is so outrageous in advertising that a reasonable person wouldn't believe that it's actually going to be delivered by the product. This must be the textbook example of a puff in some legal textbook somewhere. But the worrying part is that Richard was seeking $10,000 for alleged emotional distress, mental injury, and financial loss. Jesus Christ, Richard, how much beer did you buy? Um, which makes you wonder how much Bud Light he got through before he realized that he wasn't going to find paradise at the bottom of the bottle. The Michigan Court of Appeals ultimately dismissed the case based on Richard's failure to state a claim upon which a grief could be granted. The, I, I, I imagine they'd just be like, also, Richard, why are you smoking a crack pipe right now? The court also noted that the risks of drinking alcohol are widely known and that the advertis advertisers are entitled to employ a little puffery, there we go, in the praise of their own wares without fear of being sued by someone who takes everything just a bit too literally. Pardon me, Mr. Perfect! Let's hope life turned out alright for Richard in the end, though. Rumors abound that he was last seen sunbathing on a park bench, working his way through a crate of Heineken and a bag of 20 Strand, while fending off the imaginary ladies and getting sh**ed on by very real pigeons. Danny, you are absolutely savage to dick. I don't know what he did to offend you, but we have not sh** anyone this bad in a long time. Drama on Deer Valley Drive. Deer Valley Drive sounds like a, a bad 90s movie. I hate it when somebody stops me and asks me for directions. I can spot it happening a mile off. I'll be out walking Poppy when I suddenly notice a car that I don't recognize slowing right down as the driver tries to make eye contact with me while preparing to wind down the window. Who asks for directions? It's 2021. Just get out your phone and have a look where the f I sometimes try quickening up my own pace, but the driver never takes the hint. It's not that I don't want, Danny, just, just carry a gun. I, I'm more than happy to be helpful to strangers if somebody stops me on the street and asks me for advice on the best place in the village to grab a doner kebab with all the trimmings, or asks me to recommend a freemium, fa freemium fantasy theme based, theme turn based role playing mobile game. <laughs> with what are we talking about, Danny? With awesome graphics and an amazing storyline, I couldn't be more helpful. RSL! I, I like to say Raid Shadow Legends in these videos because I think, I don't know how, but YouTube pick up on this and then everyone gets, you know, Raid Shadow Legends advertised around this video, which amuses me greatly. Don't click on those. I mean, click on them, but don't download it because if you click on them, I get paid, which is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, but the problem with asking me for directions is absolutely anything but helpful. Maybe it's because I don't drive and so I'm not familiar with the road routes. Maybe it's because I wander aimlessly around in a state of dazed oblivion without taking the slightest bit of notice of my surroundings. Whatever the reason, if he asked me for directions to a well-known tourist spot less than five minutes away, I would struggle to tell you the best way of getting there. And yet, I still feel obliged to try my best anyway, which is obviously just making things worse, as I don't have the foggiest clue what I'm talking about. I'd be better off just being assertive and saying, like, no, I can't help you. For your own sake, move on. But that just sounds a bit rude. Thankfully, it doesn't happen quite so often these days, thanks to sat-navs and Google Maps and stuff, also COVID. But even Google Maps can apparently take a wrong turn. Back in 2000, oh yeah, okay, what are we talking about? This was the longest introduction to a section ever, Danny. Back in 2009, Lauren, 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 Lauren Rosenberg was visiting Utah for the Sundance Film Festival. It was a dark night and Lauren was on foot trying to reach 1710 Prospector Avenue, Park City. Fascinating. She whipped out her Blackberry and consulted Google Maps for advice on the best walking routes. The map tool threw up a route for Lauren, to, uh, which included a half mile stretch along the idyllic sounding Deer Valley Drive. But Lauren wasn't aware that this was an alternative name for a section of Utah State Route 224, a rural high walk highway with a distinct lack of any sidewalks. Lauren ended up walking across the highway and straight into the path of oncoming traffic. She was knocked down by a car and seriously, Lauren, don't cross a highway. If Google Maps is like, yeah, 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 just get, get on the highway, cross it. And I'll, be, I'll just be like, no, find me an alternate route. You've obviously made an error. I'm not going to walk out into the highway and then sue Google because I'm not an idiot. Allegedly. After allegedly racking up $100,000 worth of medical bills from the incident, Lauren decided to sue Google for the same amount for negligence, failure to warn, and defective design. She ranted, I relied on Google Maps and it almost got me killed. Lauren, you're just sounding like a dum-dum. However, the third judicial district court in Salt Lake City dismissed the claims on the grounds that there was no specific legal relationship or duty of protection between Google and the plaintiff. Obviously not. How did this even get in a courtroom? The court also noted that Google Maps provide a considerable value to the public and that allowing the lit 
investigation to move forward would open the floodgates to pretty much unlimited liability for Google. Yes, this is perhaps a polite and legified way of saying that Lauren should possibly have considered using her own eyes and brain before stepping out into the path of an oncoming vehicle. As Kayla Webley observed in Time Magazine, public service announcement for the day, Google may seem more powerful and all-knowing, but if it tells you to walk off a cliff, you really don't have to. It would be interesting to know if Lauren had been at the Bud Light before making a perilous journey across Deer Valley Drive. She might have been misled into thinking that she was skipping across the golden sand dunes of Barbados Bar while being chased by a tribe of Oompa Loompas. The man who sued himself. There are reasons you can sue yourself, right? Like, I feel like there's been legal cases where people have sued themselves because they have insurance for the work they do or something, and it actually did somehow make sense. Maybe this is one of those, but this is ridiculous examples. I feel that there was an actual example of this which made sense at some point. I don't remember where I remember that from. Finally. It's always good to see a man take some responsibility for his own actions. In 1995, I get the feeling this is all going to be about a man not taking responsibility for his own actions. Because if there's one thing we humans love to do, it's pass on responsibility to other people and not take ownership. It's not my fault! Not my fault! Oh my god! 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 In 1995, Robert Lee Brooke. Brock was serving a 23-year sentence at Indian Creek Correctional Center in, there's this place called Chesapeake, I think, in Virginia, but every time I look at it, it just looks like Cheapskate, <laughs> Cheapskate, Virginia, for grand larceny and breaking and entering. And Robert wasn't the type to try and pass the blame onto the government or a ropey upbringing or a bent judge or a school teacher who once made a joke at his expense in 1968. Robert knew that it was a fair cop and he only had himself to blame. So he took the only course of action that any sane individual was due, would do. He tried suing himself for $5 million. It's not quite as crazy as it sounds, and it could be argued that Robert's plan was refreshingly crafty. Well, he wasn't crafty enough to get out of a 23-year jail sentence. In a handwritten seven-page lawsuit, Robert claims that his religion forbids the partaking of alcohol, and that by getting blind drunk one fateful night in 1993, which directly led him to going out and committing wicked crimes. And here's the twist. Although Robert wanted to sue himself for $5 million, he didn't have a pot to piss in. Well, to be fair, he probably did have a pot to piss in, but that was about it. <laughs> so he was asking the state to pay the $5 million on his behalf on the grounds that he was a ward of the state who wasn't allowed to go out and earn money. And if that sounds a bit cheeky, it's worth noting that Robert did offer the federal court a kernel of good intentions by offering to pay back the $5 million once he was released from his 23-year prison sentence and settled down with a nice job. It's gonna take a while. Judge Rebecca Smith seemed fairly impressed with Robert's cunning strategy. She noted that the plaintiff has presented an innovative approach to civil rights litigation. But then the spa sport dismissed the case on the grounds that his claim, and especially the relief sought, are totally ludicrous. Good for you, judgey. That didn't stop Robert from coming back though. Between 1995 and 1996 alone, he launched a further 29 lawsuits. I mean, I guess he's in prison. What else is he going to do? Uh, mostly regarding the alleged inadequacies of prison conditions, none of which were deemed to have any merit. It's quite amazing that this is even allowed to happen. I don't know. I'd say it's pretty legit that uh, uh, someone in prison can launch lawsuits about the condition that they're kept in in prison. That seems very fair and sensible. You'd think that after the 26th attempt, yeah, fair enough though, someone might have pointed out that this prisoner is just draining everybody's time and energy and will to f live. But perhaps the courts enjoy a bit of light relief to brighten up the day. Robert's long list of complaints included improper placement of mirrors for the handicapped, lack of vitamins in the prison diet, the price of coffee, being housed with black men, Dude, <laughs> what? The mirrors are not acceptable for handicapped people. I'm not getting enough vitamins in my diet. The price of coffee is way too expensive. I hate black people. <laughs> What? Simon Whistler here again out of context. Allegations of being poisoned and experimented upon by the prison officials and perhaps most tellingly of all, poor condition and maintenance of the prison's law library. Danny, I love just how we threw in like his hardcore racism in there. Maybe all of this could have been avoided if someone had just thought to revoke his library card privileges. Or they could have just given him a Bud Light and told him that he was in a five-star hotel in Madagascar. Bada bom bom da! This episode of I have so many channels I forgot what I was doing for a second business blaze has been brought to you by hello fresh there is a link below 10 blazes the code to get you 10 meals for free why not and thank you for watching have you got a bit of a hurty neck <laughs>